just almost 60 years after the crime. Hurricane Katrina has upgraded itself to a Category 5 hurricane. 160 mile an hour winds. This is a monster storm. Massive evacuations on low ground within 5 to 10 miles of the shoreline of Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. When you uh, woke up uh, the next morning, the flooding and everything already occurred, and um, it was uh, it was terrible. There was this disrupted world. It was just, I mean, insane. David Dunnishi was a is a petty thief. He's a lifelong criminal to some extent. Even though now he's cleaning himself up and writing his autobiography. Dave was looking for money because he was dope sick all the time because he was a drug addict. At the time, everybody was told to put their wreckage and their stuff out on the street curbs, OK? And I seen on a, a pile of trash an interesting looking lampshade. They had an amino pigmentation in it. I knew it was some kind of flesh, OK? It wasn't chicken, I knew that. It wasn't cowhide. But it was some kind of flesh. The first thing that flashed through my mind was what Adolf Hitler did to, to poor Jewish people back then. He made trophy pieces. You know, he made lampshades. I remember that from my history class. So I figured, yeah, I'll find some idiot that would probably buy my story, hook, line, and sinker, and I towed it home. So I would open up my garage door here, full of all of my, um, my antiquities and artifacts. And then um, this guy, who's a friend of mine I've known for some time, he saw Dave selling all this stuff on the street. This guy came along, and he, he was interested in it. And he says, well, what's this thing made out of anyhow? And I pitched the lampshade as a, a, a bat of human from the Holocaust. My friend, he doesn't believe the story for a second, not even a moment. but. He has to have it for $35, so he buys it and takes it home. So, uh, you know, Skip's a buddy of mine, so I call him every, every so often, and I call him up, and he tells me this story. And he said, well, it's really not my problem anymore. And I said, how do you, why is it not your problem anymore? He says, because I just sent it to you. And I said, send it to me? He said, yeah, you're the journalist. You find out what it is. So a couple days later, the thing arrived at the door of my house, and that's how it came to me. Survivors recalled several human lampshades at Buchenwald, but they all disappeared shortly after the war. To determine if this was one of them, Mark first had to find out whether it was human. So back in 2007, he took the lampshade to Bodhi Technology, a world-renowned DNA lab in Lorton, Virginia. For a journalist, it's hard to know what really is credible. I mean, that's why I have to have the DNA test. After 9-11, Bodhi was chosen to identify victims and body parts from the Twin Towers. If there's any human DNA left, these scientists will find the trace. Mark called and he described what the lampshade was. But I wanted to separate my mind from the, what I'll call the social side of it and just try to focus on the science question, which was basically, uh, was this human? For Bodhi, the biggest challenge was separating the DNA of people like Mark, who had touched the lampshade over the years, from the DNA of the lamp material itself. We bleached that lampshade material, eliminating any extraneous DNA that may have come in contact with that material. So we were very confident the DNA that we were looking at was from that lampshade material, uh, not from uh, extraneous or, or overtouching of that material. And I figured that would be the end, because Bodhi would say, look, you know, it's made out of a goat or something like that. But Bodhi's results wouldn't be the end. Our final analysis was this lampshade was made from human material. When the guy said it's actually real, it was, uh, yeah, it was a shock. I was heartbroken to think that uh, somebody could do this to another human was, was uh, incredible to me. 
Although Bodhi determines the lamp is likely of human origin, it doesn't prove the victim is Jewish or that it had any connection to the Holocaust. When the original DNA testing came back and said that it was of human origin, but they couldn't figure out what kind of person, to me, that was very significant. In the years since the first DNA test, the science of DNA has advanced exponentially. DNA sequencing, really since 2006, has gone from being a small paper airplane that you would make to a Saturn V rocket that could take you to the moon. You can sequence an entire human genome in a matter of a, a day or two with, with what used to take you uh, about $5 billion and 10 to 15 years of work. Mark Jacobson heads to NYU's genetics lab, where he hopes that new DNA science can dig deeper to reveal whether the victim's ethnicity matches the typical Jewish or European profile of a Buchenwald captive. Uh, Todd? Hey. Uh, how you doing? Pleased to meet you, Mark. Nice to see you. So uh, what are you going to do? We're going to need to take probably a half a centimeter square to a centimeter how, square. How big exactly is that? Um, yeah, let's, we have plenty of that. that so yeah, it's work. A very small. The first thing we should probably do is uh, get a buccal cheek swab from you so that okay. we can test your DNA, so we can subtract that. This, what I'm going to have you do is rub this very vigorously in your cheek for maybe 30, 40 minutes. Yeah, really, really get into the cheek. And then we're just going to, I'm going to cut off the handle and put it in this tube, and that will go off to the lab for DNA analysis. So you could find out what my great-grandfather ate for breakfast on a certain day, or? No, it's, it's just going to tell us more about your heritage. So you might have some threads that you didn't know about. I have a feeling likely. when you open that up, there's going to be this whining sound like, leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> Not quite sure what to expect here. You're familiar with this whole background, yes. the social background of yes. this particular object. Well, and what is so interesting to me about that background is, you know, I heard about this stuff for years, and I just assumed has. that there was tons of evidence in museums and stuff. I'm not sure what to think. Can't, <laughs> can't, can't judge it, but again, the context is... Uh, context is powerful. I might have been handling a, a human being who was killed and tortured by the Nazis. It's, it's very stiff. And I don't know if that's true. I have no idea yet. But I'm worried about my dreams tonight. Todd removes two small pieces and sends them to two world-renowned DNA labs where they'll undergo new testing using state-of-the-art technology. He sends the first to Paleo DNA Laboratory in Thunder Bay, Canada. They are experts in extracting ancient DNA from severely degraded samples. The second goes to Mason Labs in New York City, who can bring next-generation sequencing into play. The lampshade has survived Katrina's floodwaters and may date back to the Second World War. Extracting enough DNA to reveal the victim's identity may be impossible. You always look for scientific proof. You compare it against the historical record. You also compare it against survivors' recollections. It is credible. It makes sense. This is what we know. This is what we do not know. Yes, it is very much a cold case kind of thing because now you're dealing with so-called eyewitness testimony 50 years after the fact. On April 11, 1945, the day Buchenwald was liberated, American soldiers discovered the unthinkable. American troops came upon the camps. These were men hardened by battle. They thought they had seen the worst, and then they entered the concentration camps. They had never seen anything like that. 
At once, American Army investigators begin questioning freed Allied soldiers on their experiences in these camps of the living dead. In 1937, Albert Rosenberg, a Jewish teenager, escaped from Nazi Germany and fled to America. At the end of the war, he returned to his birthplace as a U.S. Army captain in the Psychological Warfare Division. His mission was to collect information on the concentration camps and hunt down Nazi criminals. He is one of the few witnesses still alive to have seen the human skin lampshade at Buchenwald. I was in charge of a very elite group of intelligence personnel. And we were told, uh, your assignment is to uh, go to this large camp outside of the city of Weimar, which turned out to be Buchenwald. It's one of those nightmarish things. Heaps of bodies were lying around. There was terrible stink of the place. Oh, it was uh, very, very grim. Patton essentially ordered that the citizens of nearby towns be marched into these camps and see face to face what his soldiers were encountering. 1,200 civilians walked from the neighboring city of Weimar to begin a forced tour of the camp. There are many smiling faces, and according to observers, at first the Germans act as though this was something being staged for their benefit. There was a large group of people around a wooden plank. One of the first things that the German civilians see as they reach the interior of the camp is the parchment display. There were pieces of tattoo skin and two shrunken heads. And I remember there was this lamp. I said, what the hell, what the hell was this lamp? On a table for all to gaze upon is a lampshade made of human skin. These and other exhibits of Nazi origin are shown to the townspeople. What they lined up were all of the perverse things that had been done in the camp. See what your people had done. It was very dramatic, and former prisoners were there reacting. Uh, crying and carrying on. We didn't know. <laughs> yes, you knew. You saw us. You saw what was going on. The mayor, I think it was, who hanged himself afterward. Apparently at night, I have nightmares, and I wake up with nightmares. I don't remember very much about my nightmares, but it's not, uh, not easy to live with the turmoil of what I have lived through, seen, and still often don't believe that it's real. Yeah. yeah. After liberation, Al Rosenberg compiled eyewitness testimony from the camp's prisoners. The document, known as the Buchenwald Report, describes the horrific crimes committed by Nazis and details the gruesome process they used to turn human remains into trophy objects. In the official report, the Buchenwald camp is termed an extermination factory. A means of extermination, starvation complicated by hard work, abuse, beatings, and tortures, incredibly crowded sleeping conditions, and sicknesses of all types. Bodies stacked one upon the other were found outside the crematory. Here we are at the big gate of the crematorium of Buchenwald. Every morning, the corpses of the last night were collected here at the yard of the crematorium of Buchenwald. But before they burn the corpses, they brought the corpses to the medical department of the crematorium. The Nazis maintained a building at the camp for medical experiments and vivisections with prisoners as guinea pigs. And for three reasons, they brought the corpses here. The first reason was to get the golden keys. 
The second reason to get organs for medical education at the universities nearby. And the third reason was to get the human skin, for example, for a lab shade. Many of the skin artifacts recovered at Buchenwald are later presented as evidence at the Nuremberg trials. But the lampshade disappears. Could this be one of Buchenwald's missing human lampshades? Although the DNA evidence suggests it's human, so far there is no proof it came from Nazi Germany. So Mark Jacobson takes it to P.E. Guerin, a 150-year-old metal shop in New York City. It's a place called P.E. Guerin. Must have walked by here about 200 times. I never noticed it before. Here, experts will try to safely remove a sample of the frame for analysis to see if it's consistent with Nazi steel fabrication from World War II. The name of the testing is called destructive testing. I don't like the sound of that, so we'll see. That is really weird. It's basically handmade. I mean, other than spot welding this, I mean, somebody bent it, somehow clamped it on. This wasn't mass produced. It was one strut at a time. What can I take here, here, and here? That way you get this rod, you get this, and you get the joint. All right, so it's easy enough to replace that? Not a big deal? What do you mean by big deal? Um, you can do it, or you can't do it. Well, you can do it. <laughs> I have very mixed feelings about this whole thing. I mean, like, you know, half the time I feel like, oh, really, st I mean, just leave the poor thing alone. It's suffered enough. We can do this. OK, so you want to do this now? Cut it now? Yeah. Then we can all go home. With no other way to test the metal, Mark must make a call that could destroy the lampshade. So, OK. Pleasure doing business with you. Doing business with you. We'll get this part of it back together as soon as we can. I will, thank you. You're welcome. All right. I don't know. It's like kind of weird to watch the guy chop up the thing, but I don't know. I like that he's crabby. It makes me feel like he's confident. But this is what you call progress, and that's a good thing. You know, I think, you know, it's all right. Next, Mark sends the piece of the frame to Struer's lab in Cleveland, Ohio. They are a world leader in metals testing. Dr. George Vandervoort will examine the sample on a microscopic level. He's going to specifically look at the welding technique and try to put it into a context of when this kind of welding was done. We're going to cut into the sample so that we can look at the microstructure of the joint. And here's the surface. Let's take a look at this uh, with the microscope. Can you go down on the magnification and show the, the wire? Here, you can see copper in the grain boundary, this yellow phase. Copper over here, this copper all over the place. The fact that we see so much copper uh, suggests that this is not modern steel. This is definitely uh, steel from the first half of the 20th century. Exactly when, we don't know. I mean, the guy seemed more convinced than I've ever been. He was just completely positive that, like, it was, like, from World War II here, totally. So far, the forensic evidence supports the lampshade story. Based on the first DNA report, the lampshade seems to be made from human skin. Testing the frame revealed that it dates back to World War II. The thing that's been interesting about it is um, why it sticks together all these years. So um, we're trying to find out what the actual thread that holds the panels together and what, what, what's the comp composition of these threads. To learn more about the thread, Mark turns to Microtrace, a forensics lab in Chicago that's best known for helping the FBI track down the Green River serial killer. Hi, Chris. I'm Mark. Mark, nice to meet you. Fine. Meet you. Um, if it's synthetic, you can date it. 
And if it's from 1985, well, that's 1985. It's not going to be part of the story. So, you know, um, but so we'll find out what he says. So at this point, what we'll do is take out tiny amounts of thread, um, amounts so small they won't make any difference. And we can actually use the speed at which light travels through the sample to help us to characterize, to identify what the material is. Chris examines the shape of the thread under a microscope to determine what type of fiber was used in the stitching. What is this telling us about what kind of fiber okay. it might be? It's looking like a nylon fiber, and we'll confirm that by infrared spectroscopy as well. If it's a modern fiber, it would undermine the entire story. Pure nylon has a high sheen, high gloss. Delustrants are added to make fiber appear more satin. So these delustrants, I mean, do you have any idea about when they came about? A lot of that information is available. I just need to do a little bit of research to make sure that I'm telling you the right, the right dates and, and times. So this is a, this but is this is more, a this pretty is more, basic this round This is a more process. primitive synthetic fiber? It could be. Yeah, it's consistent with that. But was this primitive nylon available in Nazi Germany? For that answer, Mark will have to wait. The thing that's interesting about the nylon, the fact that it was, it was around at the time, rather than being invented in 1965 or something like that, speaks to the provenance of the thing. Back at New York City's Mason DNA Lab, geneticist Chris Mason is analyzing the new lampshade sample and searching for the ethnicity of the victim. First, he must reconfirm that the sample is human, as reported back in 2007. What we did for the first mitochondrial DNA testing would be the first generation sequencing. And we examined the sample, and it was um, uh, shocking. I don't think so, but. Cool. So, uh, which one was which again? Yeah, so we have the lampshade sample right here, and then cow and pig are here for comparison. Well, looks like it's. It looks definitely human. Geneticist Chris Mason's initial results confirm the lamp is made from human skin. But he also knows that many DNA results have been overturned in recent years as science has advanced. I was very confident that we had amplified something that was human. So I kept thinking more and more, well, how sure are we which human we amplified? Was it from contamination? Was it from anyone in the laboratory? Was it from anyone who had touched the lampshade? I'm not sure if it's contamination. I'm not sure what exactly it is. So we could try to run another PCR, or we could even take it to next generation sequencing. And so, yeah, so of the Before reporting his results to Mark, Chris must eliminate the possibility that the human outcome was caused by contamination. There is a way, uh, if you get enough genetic information from a sample, if you do uh, what is called next generation sequencing. The next generation, which has become more available in the last four or five years, uh, lets you look at you know, millions of molecules simultaneously. We'll have definitive proof that, that it was real, that it was human. Back in Brooklyn, Mark Jacobson gets some intriguing news about the lamp stitching from the fiber lab in Chicago. Hey, Chris, it's Mark Jacobson. Oh, hi, Mark, how are you? Uh, so uh, I understand you've done, got some results on this thing. Yes, I do have some results, actually. When you were here, we looked at the fibers in the stitching. I remember, that was, that was impressive that you could do that that quickly. Right, now these fibers have a birefringence on the order of greater than 0.07. Is that unusual? Extremely high birefringence for nylon. I mean, it's something that you just don't see in nylon today. It goes to suggest that it's a high-strength fiber. And where were those things used in World War II? Well, in military applications. Possibly used for parachute cord or something like that. Well, I was wondering why this thing is still sticking together as well as it is. IG Farben, which was a, is a German, IG a huge German. I know, I know who they are, yeah. Put their resources into developing military applications of this. Okay. That's kind of sobering news. Mm. Nearly 40,000 slave laborers worked to their deaths at the IG Farben factory in Auschwitz. IG Farben was a great German conglomerate. It had a whole range of industries and also was a major investor in slave labor camps. 
and in fact invested in uh, Bunamanovitz, which was a slave labor camp uh, adjacent to Auschwitz. This chemical conglomerate was most well known for producing another potent chemical. For us, their most direct linkage was the creation of Zyklon B. Uh, Zyklon B began as an insecticide and then was used in the gas chambers as the modality of killing at uh, Birkenau. But before that claim to fame, I.G. Farben's close relationship with American chemical giant DuPont afforded them a comprehensive knowledge of nylon. But the Germans added a new twist. They made it strong, very strong. Strong enough, apparently, to hold a lampshade together through the decades. That's great. That's just great. I got this slave labor fiber in my living room here. That's fantastic. <laughs> Go ahead. We can't prove a positive. We never will be able to say with absolute certainty that this is from World War II. Um, but everything that we're seeing here really starts to paint a picture that it most likely is from World War II. It's a very um, soul wrenching object, you know. I mean, I'm not Absolutely. used, I'm just not used to it, you know, even though I've had it around for a while. All right, well, hey, thanks a lot for your um, great work, and um, I guess if I ever run across another object like this, I'll give you a ring. <laughs> I'll talk to you sometime soon, I hope. Okay, sounds good, Mark. Yeah, bye-bye. He knows everything about it, so he can, like, tell you all these different things, and what it adds up to is, like, it's a nightmare. It's upsetting to find these things out, you know. I mean, basically what I told him. I mean, you know, on one hand, you're trying to prove it, you're trying to prove it, you're trying to prove it. On the other hand, you wish you didn't never saw the thing. So um, it would be fine if it just stayed a myth, you know. But actually, so it's not it. Here it is. You know? Could Mark Jacobson's lampshade be physical proof of a legendary Nazi crime. The DNA results suggest the skin is human. The metal is consistent with World War II era steel. And the nylon could have been made in a Nazi slave labor camp. But was this really created by Ilse Koch, the so-called bitch of Buchenwald? She and her husband, Commandant Koch, had created a place where sadism was fueled by unlimited power. Structural cruelty gave the opportunity for sadism to be expressed fully. Here, you're given the opportunity. Go. Whatever you want is yours. That's enormous temptation to a sadist. After liberation, Ilsa is left to face American justice. And the press devours the story of a salacious Nazi woman who makes lampshades of her victims. Her real reputation uh, in the Holocaust is the bitch of Buchenwald. It is unique to her, and it is, let's put it modestly, a, a title well earned. In the media, Ilse Koch embodies Nazi evil, and the public demands justice to be served. She is the only woman to stand trial at Dachau. When America first came in, they essentially proclaimed loudly, let the world hear of what the hell went on here. Let the world know, and, and, and we must bring these people to trial. The trial begins with damning testimony about Ilsa's sadistic fascination with tattooed skin. Three other prisoners testify that Ilsa owned a human skin lampshade. The evidence against her seems insurmountable. But by the time the defense demands to see the notorious lampshade, the prosecution falters. The evidence has vanished. The court finds Ilsa guilty, but her sentence is reduced from life to four years. Later, she's re-sentenced to life due to public outrage. Ilsa Kosh was tried, she was convicted. General Lucius Clay claimed there was not enough evidence whether he really believed it or not, I do not know. Had the lampshade been shown to him, one does not know what his reaction might have been. But its disappearance uh, made it more viable for him to say insufficient evidence. 
Could Mark's lampshade have been the key piece of evidence that would have condemned Ilsa to death? The forensic reports on the lampshade all point back to Nazi Germany. But to find out for sure, Mark must return to the scene of the crime, Buchenwald concentration camp. Here, the museum's director will evaluate the new forensic reports. I don't know, I had a lot of anxiety, I guess, about bringing it here. If indeed it's a human being that was in a concentration camp, would it really want to come back here? I'm here and I'm gonna go see uh, Fulkart Kniga, who is the, uh, runs this museum. Well, Professor, so here is the object. So now you look at the thing. What do you think? I have to say that um, historians' judgment cannot be based on impressions. What we can say is that this lampshade is for sure not the lampshade given no, I, to I'm, Mr. I, Mr. Koch at I, that time. I never imagined it would be. Yeah. But, but. We knew about one lampshade made from human skin. Mm -hmm. We have serious proofs that they, in a way, played with tattooed human skin, mm -hmm. that this production of souvenirs started. It seems as if he himself, his wife, and his SS friends considered it to be a good joke. Good joke. And I think also a symbol for their unlimited power. This is where we keep proofs of the crimes. Mm -hmm. So this is basically part of the basic mindset that would produce a human skin lampshade. Just the idea that you could do whatever you wanted to do with human beings as sort of uh, yeah. experiment animals. It has a lot to do with this Nazi idea that humans are unequal. That a certain people like the Jewish people is inferior. And this has biological reasons. What they said about Jewish people and basically non-German people, I mean, somehow their life is not worth living, right? That they should be made into lampshades because, like, you know, they're just Jews, I mean, yeah. So we had to take serious the question, is this a new proof of crimes that confronts us with what happened in Buchenwald? Well, Mark, now we are the so-called tower of the entrance gate building that became a symbol of Buchenwald. You can get a good feeling because it's cold now, it's so foggy, it's so typical Buchenwald weather. So when you, uh, when you look out at this fog, you see the difficulty of the historical record, what you can see and what you can't see, what we can know and what we can't know. Well. It's an interesting metaphor, also because we also have, always have to try to go through the fog and have a better sight on what happened. Yeah. He's a very eloquent guy, and I think that he has different ways of thinking about these things the way historians do. It still added up to the thing that he believed it was a real object and that it was a very important object because of the historical metaphor that it um, presented. Soon after returning from Buchenwald, Mark gets a call from the Canadian DNA lab, specialists in extracting ancient DNA. If anyone can uncover the ethnicity of the victim, they can. Oh, hello. Can you see me? I can see you fine. Can you see me okay? Yeah, I can see you perfectly. Awesome. But what they're about to tell Mark will add a twist to the story no one sees coming. Um, all right. Well, do you have something to tell me? Uh, we do have something to tell you. Um, as you know, they, they sent us a piece of the lampshade. Mm -hmm. It was extremely difficult trying to get um, human DNA off of this lampshade. And uh, in our findings, uh, we determined that the lamp is actually not of human origin. It's actually made of Bos Taurus. 
which is a domestic cow. Domestic cow? Domestic cow. Um, well, how do you account for the uh, previous finding that was human? Well, uh, this, this uh, analysis took place many years ago, and a lot of protocols have changed since then. The other labs recommended that you really need to go right inside the lampshade and look at a cross section. And that's what we were able to do, was actually go inside the lampshade. And I think that previous labs were just detecting um, DNA that was on the surface and they couldn't quite get rid of it at the time. Hmm. Well, how about that? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, um, that's, that's an interesting finding. So, um, are you satisfied that that's what it is? I am very satisfied uh, that that is, is, is what it is. By employing DNA extraction methods not used when the lamp was first tested, the Canadian lab has challenged the initial finding of human. I really don't know what to make of that. I mean, you know, I never assumed that that would be what, what would happen, but... It just seems uh, odd, considering all the other circumstantial evidence that we got. One guy tells you one thing, another guy tells you another thing. I'm a little surprised, but uh, we'll see what happens. Now, Mark heads to Mason Labs in Manhattan to learn what they've discovered in the lampshade sample sent to them. Mason has put its lampshade fragment through the next generation sequencer, a machine that analyzes samples billions of times more precisely than methods available when the lamp was first tested. If you ask me if I have any hopes about what this guy's gonna find, um, I don't know what. You know, I, I just don't know what they'll say. But I've been looking at this thing for a long time and I just feel that it's not a cow. You know, I don't feel it's a cow. Because of the accuracy and high resolution of the DNA sequencing technologies today, one could easily argue that 90, 95, even 99 percent of previous studies should be re-examined. Just 12 hours earlier, Chris's preliminary finding on his lampshade sample showed it was of human origin. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. So, uh, should we grab a seat? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we just got the, the confirming data this morning. We got 6.7 million 50 base pair reads, and we compared it to human, cow, and pig. And uh, I can tell you that I'm 99% sure, I'd even say 100% sure, uh, at least from this data and those samples are of cow origin. Hmm, so it's not a human. Why, uh, I, I strongly believe not. The PCR reaction can be contaminated with even one cell. So it's very possible that some portion of your DNA and also anyone who is near the sample could give us enough signal to look human. What I'd like to know, just for my own personal edification, is um, did I do the right thing to go with the existing data at the time? Yes. That was the only thing I could have done at that exactly. point. Exactly. I think just as today, I'm, I think I'm doing the best I can do by using the most up-to-date technology to give you the, the best answer I can give. I feel a little bit bad, but I think knowing the truth is better than living in a delusion. So I think even though he might be shocked, I think hopefully he'll be happier that he knows the truth. The search comes to a close with the shattering revelation. Mark's lamp is almost certainly not human and cannot help solve the mystery of Buchenwald's missing lampshade. Buchenwald is the place where you have all of the legends of human skins, legend and reality of human skins. I think there's way too much there to have it in the status of an urban legend. If I were, you know, to give you my gut judgment on that, uh, I would imagine that uh, almost all of it is true. All right, so here we have the stuff, right? In a special box. This box, I've been carrying this box all around the world, right? So, all right. Now, you know what you know, right? You know that it's a cow. You know, it's a cow, but it's not a cow. It's an object. 
that exists in the world to tell you a tale. It's something that to think about, regardless of what it is. And people would say, well, you know, it's just another one of those kind of Jewish myths, you know, that they're trying to, like, convince us or something. I, I, you know, whatever people are going to say, whatever the haters are going to say, I say to them that they don't know what they're talking about. So anyhow, I owe a lot to the lampshade. And I'll never forget it, because it taught me a lot about this world. <laughs>